transistor that you just saw looks like this in the frequency domain. In fact, it keeps going, but I'm not looking at the higher frequencies. But one of these guys, the first one, the biggest tone, is the frequency of oscillation of the crystal. The reason all these other harmonics are present is because this is a square wave, and a square wave uh, consists of multiple harmonics of the main signal. So if I take a marker and I look at the peak, the peak of this signal is at 4 MHz. That's the frequency oscillation. And the next peak is at 8 the next one after that is at 12. These are all the harmonics, the first, second, third, fourth, and so on. So all these tones are present because it's a square wave. Now, is this matter, is this bad or not? Well, depends on what you're doing with the crystal oscillator. If you're using the crystal oscillator to clock a processor, it doesn't matter because a processor gets its timing information from edges. So rising or falling edges of the clock will advance the uh, execution cycle in a processor. So in that case it's not important because the processor is simply counting edges. It doesn't care if there are harmonics, it doesn't care if it's a sinusoid. But if this were to be used in a, some type of wireless system where the, the, where the, uh, the signal is going to be used in a mixer, it's going to mix with some other tone to produce another frequency, then these harmonics are very important because these harmonics are also going to go through the mixer mix with your design signal and create all sort of spurious tones that you are not interested in. So we're not getting a little bit into more advanced topics. But it's sufficient to know that um, this square wave produces all these tones and you have to keep that in mind depending on the application you're using. For a processor, not so important. So that's the signal coming from uh, the, uh, the crystal. Now let's zoom around the fundamental tone, the main tone you're interested in. Let's look only at that tone and see how stable it is with respect to uh, time, how stable it is at 4 megahertz. So let's take a look at that. I will go marker, I will bring that uh, particular uh, go next peak and then bring it to the center. So that's my now 4 megahertz. I will reduce the span and make the span 1 megahertz. So now we're looking at this is our signal why does it look like that? Again, you need to understand how this instrument works. Is because of the resolution bandwidth is quite large with respect to the span, so I will reduce the resolution bandwidth as much as it goes. I think 1 kilohertz is as low as it goes. And here we go. There it is. Here's our signal. I will raise the minimum uh, amplitude here, so the signal moves up, minus 10 dBm, and I will also turn the attenuation off. Attenuation 0 and 2. There we go. So here's our signal. And you can see how clean and how stable that center frequency is. I'm going to zoom in, means go further inside in, 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 and then reduce the span. So span is 1 megahertz. Reduce the span even further. Make the span 100 kilohertz, so 10 times smaller. And here's our tone. There it is. So the instrument reports the center frequency to be 4.0005 megahertz, so very, very close to 4 megahertz. And you can see the shape uh, that I was talking about before. And you can see the main amplitude. This is a very very stable signal right around 4 megahertz where it needs to be and you can see that it doesn't move around very much at all so what I can do is now remember what this looks like and I'm going to now switch to the crystal uh, switch to the oscillator that I built and I'm going to look at the spectrum in the same way and see what it looks like so let's do that so I will take this one I'll go outside so you can see what I'm doing so now I will take the other channel, disconnect this, connect this one, like so, and I will do this. I will preset the instrument. As we were saying before, every time you want to do a new measurement, it's a good idea to do that. And we will go frequency again, start, zero, stop, 
say at uh, same thing we were doing, 50 megahertz. Here we go. And then I will also reduce the resolution bandwidth as we did before. So the same setting. Look at this one. So let's zoom in again. You can immediately tell that this guy has much less harmonics than the signal you were just looking at before. And the reason is because if you remember, the, the waveform in the time domain did not really look like a square wave. And I was saying that the reason for that was because there was bandwidth limitations in the system which prevented a nice generation of a square wave. So you can see that as the frequency goes up, all the harmonics get smaller and smaller. And this is due to the bandwidth limitation. You can think of a low pass filter going over these tones. So again the fundamental is right there the, P, the, uh, the main frequency of oscillation right there and it's reported to be also just around 4 megahertz just like the crystal oscillator was. So I'm going to go and zoom in and focus around this one the same way I was doing before reduce the span to 1 megahertz repeat bring it to the center reduce the span even more 100 kilohertz span, reduce the resolution bandwidth to 1 kilohertz. Now, let's look at this. Now, if you remember, look at the stability of this with respect to time and compare it to what you were seeing before. Let me bring the amplitude, the reference higher, just so that we can have an exactly the same setting as we had in the other case. Here we go. Look at this one. And compare it to the stability of the crystal oscillator that you saw before. It's too bad that we can't look at them at the same time because they only have one of these instruments. But look at how different it is and how much this waveform is shifting by left and right. And you can see how every time the measurement is done, the, way, the shape of that wave looks a little bit different. The center, the tallest point, the peak looks a little bit different. And this is all because of the instability of the ring oscillator with respect to time. Because the frequency is not stable, the phase is not stable, and it's drifting all over the place. It's an essentially an unlocked oscillator that is um, limited by a whole bunch of thermal and flicker and a whole bunch of sources of noise from that circuit that the crystal oscillator does not suffer from. So immediately by looking at the spectrum, you can tell how different the performance of a crystal oscillator is compared to a regular ring oscillator, which you couldn't really tell looking at the waveform on that oscilloscope. Now if you have a different oscilloscope that has a very um, precise timing, you can actually measure the jitter of that signal and then you can see the difference there too. But this instrument gives us a very good idea of how much difference there is between one versus the other. So now what I want to do is I want to uh, forget about looking at it in the spectral domain, I just want to look at the frequency and let's see how stable the frequency is as a function of temperature and as a function of power supply. So to do that I will connect the circuit yet to a different instrument, this time we will connect it to this guy right here, which is a, um, a frequency counter and a power meter. We're only going to be using the frequency counter function. So what this guy does is that you give it a signal and it will tell you what the frequency is. That's it. That's all it does. But it does it very, very precisely. It give you a whole bunch of digits. So we're going to connect it to this. I'm going to disconnect it from the, from the uh, uh, spectrum analyzer. Keep everything else the same. Then I will connect the crystal to this first. We can see the frequency. We'll do some temperature measurement and then I will connect the ring oscillator and then we will do the same thing. So let's get that going. We'll disconnect this guy. Like that. So this guy is still on, still at 5 volts and I will power on this guy. Here we go. Like this. So first, connect the crystal oscillator into the ear to measure this its frequency, and I will zoom in so you can see it. There we go. And I will change the input to go. Uh, oops, like so. 
There we go. So let's zoom in here. And look at what it says. It says 3.999968 megahertz. So it tells us the exact frequency of oscillation. You can see how close it is to being 4 megahertz. Now in reality, I should turn this instrument on for at least half an hour before I start using it because it has to warm up and its own internal reference frequency has to stabilize before it can give me an exact measurement. But we just want to do um, relative measurements here so it shouldn't be such a big deal. So we can see that it's very close to the 4 megahertz that we want to. Now I want to do, uh, I'm going to increase the power supply. Go back down here. I'm going to increase the power supply from 4.9 volts to 5.1 volts. So for, I'm sorry, from 5 volts to 5.1 volts. So I'm going to increase it by, by 100 millivolts and see the effect of that on the frequency. Okay? So I will bring it back to the instrument and then I will press that, press and go up by 100 millivolts and you can see the shift in the frequency. So here we go. So 3.99. 968. So I'm going to go up by 100 millivolts and I'm going to do that right now. There you go. I went up by 100 millivolts and this changed by 1 hertz. So the frequency changed by only 1 hertz when I went up by 100 millivolts. If I go by another, if I go up by another, another 100 millivolts, so now we're at 5.2 volts, it went, it changed now down by 1 hertz again. So then I go back to 5 volts, goes back to 968. So very, very little change in frequency as a function of power supply. Now, this is only impressive once you see the effect it has on the frequency of oscillation of, our, our, of the other circuit of the ring oscillator. So I'm going to now disconnect. So I'm going to come back down here. This is the ring oscillator. I will now disconnect this guy and connect the ring oscillator. Like so. And now we're going to look at this again. Look at that. Here we go. First thing we notice is that, well, it's 3.93, it's very close to 4 megahertz like before, but look at this. It's all over the place. Every time this gate, which is a single measurement, every time this gate is triggered, it measures a different, a completely different frequency. It's shifting by hundreds of hertz all over the place. Again, showing the frequency instability, the, the, the variation in the frequency of the ring oscillator. Now, remember this, I'm going to increase the power supply by 100 millivolts, just like I did with the crystal. And let's see how much does this change. Ready? I'm going to do it right now. Look at that. It changed by more than 100 kilohertz, or just around 100 kilohertz. That's crazy. Now if I go another 100 millivolts up, changed by almost another 100 kilohertz. So it's thousands of times worse, tens of thousands of times worse in, compar in compared to a crystal oscillator when it comes to voltage uh, power supply variation. So if I, if, if I were to use this as my reference for anything, let's say for your microprocessor, and your system changes by 100 millivolts, all the timing in the microprocessor is going to change because the frequency of this ring oscillator is a very strong function of power supply voltage. And that's not surprising because if you, as I said before, the propagation delay through an inverter is a function of power supply. So that's going to have some effect. So I'm going to go back to 5 volts again. And you can see, again, a huge shift in, uh, in, in frequency. So right away you can appreciate how much beneficial, uh, the more beneficial the crystal oscillator is in comparison.